Hello and welcome to our video summarising all you need to know about the Conflict Poetry Anthology which is part of the Edexcel Anthology as well as the Edexcel exams when it comes to English literature. My name is Barbara and in this video we'll examine all the poems in this anthology. We'll begin by looking at the poet's background as part of your context as well as analysing each poem. So let's get started. Now this collection begins with A Poison Tree by William Blake. Now a little bit about William Blake himself. He was born on the 28th November 1757. He's not only an English poet, but also known as a visionary of his time. He was a painter, a printmaker, and art was always what attracted his poetry. He belonged to what we call the Romantic Era, whereby poems depict emotions, consequences of emotions, as well as nature. And nature is really seen as the highest manifestation of innocence, and anything to do with the city is seen as somewhat corrupting. Although he wasn't really recognised during his time, he turned out to be really famous posthumously. Now, let's have a look at the poem itself, A Poison Tree. So, it's one of his most appreciated works, and essentially it's part of a wider anthology of William Blake, his own, which is called Songs of Experience, which was a follow-on from a previous anthology called Songs of Innocence, and it was published in 1789. Now, the poem itself, A Poison Tree, has four different stanzas. It starts as a first-person poem, where the poet is expressing his anger and hatred towards his enemy. The poem then takes a turn, and the pronoun I is replaced with the word, or the pronoun it, to depict the feelings of the enemy. The poet uses a metaphorical style, for instance, apple depicts his vengeance, tree depicts his loss of patience, underneath which he kills his enemy, and so on. Also, Blake in this poem uses end rhyme, which really drives the message home. As in the first, second, third and fourth line of the poem's first stanza, you can see the words friend and end, and both at the end of their respective lines, which rhyme, such as also foe and grow. Now let's look more closely at the first stanza. So the poet is expressing his anger towards his friend as well as his foe in this stanza. Also, do bear in mind that it can also be the narrator, so this doesn't always refer to Blake himself. Whilst writing about this, you can also just refer simply to the narrator. However, the voice appears to be really angry towards this foe, and he has depicted the difference between two types of anger. He states that when you're angry with a friend, you convince your heart to forgive him. Even though you are hurt and you know that he did an injustice to you, you try your best to forget the past and end the feeling of vengeance in your heart. However, when you're angry with an enemy, it takes a long time for you to calm your anger, yet the anger and feeling of vengeance doesn't diminish even with time. In fact, this feeling simply grows. Now in the second stanza, the narrator is trying to make a confession that it is he who's solely responsible for the hatred that's grown in his heart for his enemy, and it's he who's increased the vengeance in his heart. He's nurtured this hatred with his fears, spending hours together crying for the ill that's been caused to him by his enemy. Now in the third stanza, the speaker states that it's because of his dwelling in the same hatred that this hatred has grown every day. The hatred has, metaphorically speaking, given birth to an apple and this fruit signifies the evil that has taken birth in the heart of the poet. He states that it's now come to a point where he can't really turn back and forget his enemy. He can't forget about him until he does something to soothe this vengeance. And finally, the day comes when the speaker's enemy has met the evil fruit of vengeance and has grown his fears, tears and sarcasm and the fruit has now turned into a weapon. Now, in the fourth stanza, as the narrator states, the very next morning this purpose is served. When the speaker wakes up and glimpses the garden, he sees something that relaxes his mind and calms the vengeance forever. The darkness of the night acted like an invisible cloak for them, and now it's a beautiful morning. And there, lying, is his enemy, dead under the tree of his hatred. He bit the poisoned apple of the speaker's vengeance. In other words, he was murdered. Now let's move on to the second poem in this collection, which is The Destruction of Senna Cherub by Lord Byron. Now, Lord Byron himself was born in 1788, in other words, he was a contemporary of William Blake. His father died when he was three, with the result that he inherited his title from his great uncle in 1798. Byron spent his early years in Aberdeen and was educated at Harris School as well as Cambridge University. 
and in many ways when we look at his work he was seen as the ideal of the romantic poet and one of the things that's really important contextually is that he gained a great deal of notoriety for a lot of his scandalous affairs whilst he was married and many people described him as mad bad and dangerous to know now, when it comes to the poem itself, The Destruction of Sennacherib, this is a narrative poem that tells the story of how God destroys King Sennacherib's Assyrian army as they attack the city of Jerusalem. This story is found in the Old Testament, though it's an episode that's probably unfamiliar to quite a few people who are not very familiar with the Bible. Now, in the Bible, Sennacherib attempted to besiege Jerusalem. When his soldiers came upon all the fenced cities of Judah, they tried to take them, and so Hezekiah, the king of Judah, prayed to God and received the reply through the prophet Isaiah that he could defend his city, save it for God's own sake. And in the night, an avenging angel visited Sennacherib's camp and destroyed this army, pushing Sennacherib to return to Nineveh. So this poem is essentially based on this story taken from the Bible. Now, it's worth pointing out that this siege of Jerusalem is actually historically known to have happened, and this happened around 701 BC. So, of course, this is really important contextual knowledge to know. Now, Byron takes and writes this poem and its events chronologically, which starts with the Assyrians besieging Jerusalem, and it moves on to an angel who visits the camp, quietly killing everything it comes into contact with. And here, Byron does take some liberties, pulling forth gratuitous and wondrous imagery of the siege and the murder of the Assyrian army. Now let's look at the first stanza. There is, despite the simplicity of this stanza, a certain ferocity that's evoked in the phrase, the Assyrian came down like the wolf in the fold. This phrase in the stanza is certain to refer to Sennacherib, and it works to evoke the image of his ferocity, his single-minded pursuit of Jerusalem, as well as his grace and deadly power. Also, the image of the wolf on the fold serves to give the reader half a view into a very different world, which is wild, dangerous, where a wolf or a predator is constantly at the door. Also notice the vividness of the colours that Byron has used in this stanza. At the time, purple and gold was seen as a royal combination of colours, so Byron appears unabashed in this description of Sennacherib, outfitting him as a modern king should be outfitted. There are also references to the points of the spears as stars in the sea, which further emphasises Sennacherib's own power. He's so unwittingly strong that he seems to encompass the universe and the soldiers look nothing more like marauding stars, gleaming larger than life in the darkness. They're a constant, as we can tell when we read the next line, which is when the blue wave rolls nightly on the deep Galilee. The Assyrian soldiers have therefore been waiting for quite some time outside of the city of Jerusalem and one can assume that this is quite late into the siege. Now, in the second stanza, Byron evokes the core tenets of Romanticism. Do you remember what I mentioned with regards to Romantic era, whereby, in many ways, a lot of Romantic poets in the 1700s essentially used nature in a lot of their writing, and nature, to some degree, was seen as encompassing innocence. But always remember, when it comes to the Romantic era, nature is really powerful. Now, in this case, Byron is evoking Romanticism by comparing the evading Assyrian army to leaves in the summer. They are plentiful, vibrant with life, and very much aware of the presence in the world. And then in the next stanza, he carries on with this imagery, and he refers to them as, and to quote from the poem, leaves of the forest when the autumn hath blown. It's amazing how this simple turn of phrase creates an image in the mind of the reader. From there, Byron writes, and to quote, the host on the morrow lay withered and strown. And this brings up such a mental picture of the broken bodies of the soldier lying scattered all around the ground, smitten where they stood by God's avenging angel, who, depending on the Bible that you're reading, can take the name Angelos Kiru or Malachar El Horim. Now in the third stanza, the angel of death makes his appearance. One can see how Byron took the imagery, the, the imagery in his own liberties, and there's something especially beautiful about how he describes the angel of death here. This angel of death isn't violent, isn't angry. He appears and moves slowly through the soldiers, breathing in their faces, and that's all he needs to do. It helps the reader to understand just how strong the will of God is and just how terrifying and alien and deadly the idea of God's angels are. And it's worth noting that in the Bible, especially in the Old Testament, angels were considered terrifying. They were considered otherworldly beings that looked 
utterly inhuman and horrifying to the masses. Hence, it wasn't surprising that the first word they spoke to people in several, several instances, especially in the Bible, was be not afraid or a variation of this. Death is also depicted as a gradual process, to quote from the poem, and the eyes of the sleepers waxed deadly in chill. But death is also quite instant. It's not terribly long and it doesn't hurt. One minute, someone is alive, they breathe, and the next, they cease existing and they're cold and chilly on the ground. Now, in the fourth stanza, Byron takes one step further and describes the dead soldiers. To quote, and there lay the steed with his nostril all wild. And he writes, somehow the image of this horse brought low is far more animated than the death of the soldiers. There's an element of fighting in the way even the horse died. Note the words, the foam of his gasping, which occurs when a horse is particularly scared or worried. Note the reference to rock beating surf, which is an expression that calls back the wildness of the waves, forever stilled now in terms of the horse. It's almost as though the horse has understood something far more than what the soldier did. It knew it was dying in the way that the soldier couldn't comprehend. Now, in the fifth stanza, compared to it then, to the peacefulness of the death of the rider, all we are given is a view of how he lay, distorted and pale, and how there was, and to quote, a dew on his brow and rust on his mail, and how the tents were all silent, the banners alone. There's a lot of stillness in this stanza as compared to the wild death of the horse. This silence, when in the previous stanza there wasn't very, there was very little of this silence. None of the soldiers fought back. None of the soldiers knew what happened to them. Death was a sudden driving process, taking them unawares and breaking their army to pieces in a single night. In the final stanza, the sixth stanza, that activity returns, but not from the dead army of Sennacherib, however from others, their wives, mothers, their families. To quote from the poem, the widows are of Ashur, allowed in their well. The idols are broken on the temple of Baal. This shows that whatever happened to the army of Sennacherib is almost a perversity. Now let's move on to the next poem, extract from The Prelude by William Wordsworth. Now Wordsworth himself, again, is a romantic poet and he was born in 1770 in Cumbria. His father was a lawyer, however both of his parents died before he was 15 and he and his four siblings were taken and left in the care of different relatives. As a young man, Wordsworth developed a love of nature and this theme is reflected in many of his poetries. Now, when it comes to the poem itself, the prelude, this poem presents two contrasting ideas about nature and it allows the reader to decide what nature means to him or her. The context of this extract is from the prelude, which is a much longer poem, so do bear in mind that this comes from the original poem, which is far longer. This poem provides insight into the speaker and the author. This poem explores Wordsworth's own childhood, arguably, and the ways in which he's changed and grown over time. The poem begins the speaker as a boy and explores his feelings of peace with nature. Then an event occurs which changes his feelings towards the world, which represents the boy coming of age and understanding the dangers of the world. In other words, losing the innocence. Now let's begin with the first 16 lines of this poem. The opening lines reveal the speaker's relationship with her or nature. So bear in mind that nature is personified within this poem as a woman. Nature leads him to a boat and it's clear that the speaker has a really peaceful view of nature as he rows out onto the peaceful waters, led gently by nature herself. As he rose, he could hear, and to quote, mountain echoes and small circles glittering, as his boat made ripples in the water. He then describes a sparkling light as it reflects off the surface of the water, and while enjoying all that nature has to offer in the moment, the narrator fixes his gaze on the destination. He set out to reach a craggy ridge, and he looks up at the horizon's utmost boundary and sees, and to quote, nothing but stars and the grey sky. In these opening lines is a really tranquil and beautiful picture of nature and a young person's ability, and we can argue it's a young boy's ability to engage with it, to some extent also have some mastery over it. Now, in line 1720, we start learning the boy's understanding of his own ability to control nature. 
even if he had a small boat but an elf in penance, he was still able to control his little boat and cut through the river like a swan, or in other words, the water like a swan. Now, in lines 21 to 31, there's a drastic shift in tone as this person encounters some type of beast that can only be described as, and to quote from the poem, black and huge. Whatever it was, it upreared its head, so this thing is personified. And even though the speaker struck out at the beast again and again, and as he also tried to row again and again, this thing just continued to rise and grow bigger, and even more menacing. The speaker thought it seemed as though it had a purpose of its own. This beast strode after him, it was chasing after him, and suddenly the speaker is no longer enjoying what he felt initially was a peaceful encounter with nature. Now there's something to fear greatly. He turns his boat around and makes his way back, and to quote, with trembling oars. This change has an important impact on both the reader as well as the speaker. While the opening lines, as we've mentioned, paint a picture of the speaker as someone who's really peaceful and one with nature, experiencing great joy in the peaceful waters, these lines mark an important change, in other words, a volta. The experience the speaker has here reveals that nature is not always man's friend. In fact, there are mysterious and dangerous things hidden within nature. Nature is suddenly now something not only to be enjoyed, but also be feared and to some degree respected. Now, in lines 32 to 44, this reveals the effect that this experience has had on the speaker. After having encountered this dark side of nature which has terrified him, he's become aware that he's not in control and he wasn't able to subdue it and use it to his pleasure. And this continues to haunt him, obviously symbolising his removal from innocence and into experience as he realises the darker side of nature. The speaker reflects on what, and to quote from the poem, he used to be pleasant images of trees or sky, and now they are huge and mighty forms that do not live. These thoughts, therefore, and to quote, were a trouble to his dreams by night and through the mind by day. This shows he's really haunted now by this realisation of nature. The speaker suddenly fears what he had not feared before, and it symbolises moving from childhood to adulthood. Now let's move on to the next poem in this collection, The Man He Killed by Thomas Hardy. Now Hardy is a Victorian writer and he lived through the experiences of war firsthand. He also had a keen interest in history and also one thing to bear in mind is a lot of his romantic relationships did fall apart so a lot of the things that he also talks about reflects the cynicism when it comes to romance and love however in this case his first-hand experiences of war and the destructive nature of war are really reflected now when it comes to the poem the man he killed he wrote this as a way to explore his feelings about the boer wars which were going on during this time and bear in mind that great britain was essentially engaged in the boer war on south african soil against the dutch now a lot of people at the time during this war so this is during the victorian age actually supported great britain so do remember that Great Britain at this time was expanding its empire and hence why it was there in South Africa. However, it came across the Dutch settlers who also were trying to establish their own territory and their own form of colonialism in South Africa. So of course there was conflict. Now, Hardy's poem talks about this particular conflict and he makes this war and its impacts really vivid and really personal. This poem follows a simple rhyme scheme there's an ABAB rhyme scheme and the result ironically is that there's an almost nursery rhyme kind of feeling even if the content and the subject is about war and killing which is the opposite so this is supposed to create a sense of irony. Now let's look at the first stanza. So this poem begins with a hypothetical idea that the speaker and a man meet up in some old ancient inn. Because the title of this poem is The Man He Killed, the readers can assume that the speaker is referring to the man he killed. He's given a hypothetical idea and a hypothetical scenario to help the readers understand the humanity of both of them. So both of these two soldiers at combat, but maybe in another world if they'd met in this inn. Immediately, the readers therefore can picture two men meeting up just by chance, sitting down and having a drink together. And Hardy refers to this as Nippikin 
which is a type of container that held a certain amount of liquid in a pub. The stanza makes it clear that the speaker wishes he had met this man under different circumstances. The reader doesn't yet know what the circumstances were that led to the speaker shooting this man. It doesn't sound like the speaker had any particular hateful feelings towards him and it certainly doesn't sound like the speaker had any reason to kill the man. In fact, it sounds like he rather wishes he hadn't killed this individual. Now in the second stanza, the word but jolts the reader out of the hypothetical and back to reality. In real life, we see the speaker as part of an infantry. He stares a man in the face and shoots him, and the man also shoots at the speaker. However, the speaker says that he, and to quote, killed him in his place. So of course, it's the speaker who survives. This stanza reveals to the reader that the speaker essentially had a near-death experience. And don't forget, when it comes to war, the, these near-death experiences can, of course, lead to post-traumatic stress disorder. However, the speaker being so focused on the man he shot doesn't give any insight into what he felt being the man to survive this encounter and walk away. The fact that he was face to face with this other man showed that either of them had an equal chance of death and it was only chance that the speaker managed to walk away alive and the other man, who's a complete stranger, fell and died. Perhaps this near death experience was what caused the speaker to really reflect about the other man and really think about how he could have met him in different circumstances. Now, in the third stanza, the first two lines reveal that the speaker doesn't really know why he shot the man. He says, and to quote from the poem, I shot him dead because... And then there's a pause. The reader can imagine him thinking about this. He doesn't know why he killed him. He can't even come up with a reason. However, he finally does consider a reason. He says he killed him because he was a foe. Then he asserts, and to quote, My foe, of course, he was. That's clear enough. Now this line shows as if he's trying to justify what he did when he shot the man and it's clear that the speaker is quite uncomfortable with what he's done and is trying to reason with himself to convince himself that he's done the right thing shooting him. He feels somewhat that he has a deeper reason even if he can't find one. Now in the fourth stanza at first the speaker tries to justify shooting this man. Then he begins to think about this man's life. He supposes that this man, just like him, wasn't listed in the military offhand because it was out of work, just like him. The speaker thinks about the man as being somewhat like himself. He, as a speaker, enlisted because he didn't have another job. He didn't know what else to do. He didn't really go to war with a desire to kill a man. He was doing a job and now he's killed somebody, someone who belongs to a family. And he can't explain to himself why he's done it. In the fifth stanza, the speaker, after trying to first justify shooting the man, then thinks about the man's life and concludes that war is a very strange thing. He calls it, and to quote from the poem, quaint and curious. Because in war, you might shoot the very same man who, in peacetime, you would actually quite like and treat to a pint of liquor at the pub. Now, the next poem in this collection is Cousin Kate by Christina Rossetti. Now, a little bit about Rossetti herself. Her reputation is remarkably direct and she is a compelling poet who has written a whole load of different poetry. And do try and refer back to one of our previous videos where we do look at Christina Rossetti in detail and look at her own collection of poems, including The Goblin Market. Now, Rossetti was a Victorian poet. She was born in December 1830 to a lively and artistic family. She is the daughter of an Italian scholar called Gabriel Rossetti and sister to the poet and artist Dante Gabriel Rossetti. She was homeschooled and when her father died, her mother became a governess and she later on in 1845 suffered a nervous collapse. Do bear in mind also with Rossetti that she was deeply religious and this is reflected in her writing. She went on to write a lot of poetry by imitation and a lot of her work was really reflective of both her resolve not to get married, she broke off an engagement, but also her view of God and she examines the sacred and the secular. Now let's look at this poem in particular. So when we look at the first stanza, the poem begins with the description of a beautiful young maiden who spent her days out in the sun and air. She was content to be with her cottage mates and she had no thought for a man and no desire for anything that she didn't already have. She claimed she didn't even know that she was a beautiful girl until a great lord found her. She asks, and to quote from the poem, Why did a great lord find me out and praise my flaxen hair? 
This, of course, is a rhetorical question, and the tone of this question suggests that the affair with the great lord didn't really end well. She asks again, and to quote, Why did a great lord fill me out to fill my heart with care? This rhetorical question shows that the great lord made her feel something for him. Maybe she fell in love. However, maybe she then realises perhaps that she was just a mistress and something to just be cast aside once he was done. Now we learn that while she was once a young beautiful maiden without a care in the world, the attentions of this great lord caused her to become a young maiden quite in love with him and someone especially of a superior social status. She likely lost her virginity to him and he was very much married and then he just cast her aside and perhaps she did this to try and gain up a one up on the societal ladder but she realized she couldn't really climb socially now in the second stanza the speaker uses the word lord to suggest that the great lord didn't have pure intentions for her she says that when he took her into his home he and to quote wooed her for joy thereof here readers can see that the great lord did this for his own joy and this was at the word of the young maiden. She says that he took her, and to quote, to lead a shameless, shameful life, and to make her his plaything and his love. The way the speaker describes her life as a mistress of this great lord reveals that he just used her for his own sexual satisfaction without a thought at how this is going to alter her life and the rest of her days. Do bear in mind, of course, contextually when it comes to the Victorian era, women were expected to be virgins before they married, and if a woman wasn't a virgin, she was seen as ineligible for marriage. This was worse still for women who were of a lower social standing, because marriage was really one of the ways in which they could protect themselves economically. Now, of course, this woman loses her virginity to this lord, therefore she's in many ways seen as used goods. She then says, and to quote from the poem, he changed me like a glove, and this simile shows that she felt that she was nothing more than a toy or an article of clothing to this man. He used her while she was new and exciting, and then he set her aside when she was done with him. Now, in the third stanza, there's a shift so that the speaker is not talking to the readers anymore, but to her cousin Kate. It's possible she's been talking to Kate all along. When she calls her Lady Kate, she makes it clear that her cousin has risen in social status to become a lady. Her cousin has chosen the right man, who has maybe followed the right social conventions, then married her and given her this title. Therefore, the speaker reveals that her little cousin grew to be even more beautiful than she was herself, and this great lord saw her at her father's gate, chose her and cast aside the speaker and married her instead. Now, in the fourth stanza, the speaker reveals that Kate was also, and to quote, good and pure, so he bound her with his ring. And of course, there's irony here because the Lord, this man who essentially took the speaker's virginity away, then saw her as soiled by their sexual encounter. So he wanted another purer woman, hence he chose her cousin. Because Kate wouldn't allow this great Lord to take her to bed without marriage, he therefore married her. Thus, she rose to the position of the lady, and the speaker says to her, and to quote, the neighbours call you good and pure, call me an outcast thing. She then says that she sits in the dust and howls, she, and the imagery comes from the biblical book of Job, and this description of sitting in the dust and howling is well known as the epitome of despair. The speaker contrasts herself with Kate, saying that while Kate sings, she sits in gold. And this is a stark contrast to the speaker who's howling in the dust. But then the speaker asks a question to Kate. She says, which one of us has a tenderer heart? This question implies that the speaker believes herself to have more feeling in her heart than Kate. And the last line of the stanza, the speaker claims that Kate had, and to quote, the stronger wing. And her previous question leaves the readers with a picture of the speaker as the sweeter and the more tender of the two, whilst Kate perhaps was the stronger. Now in the fifth stanza, the speaker begins to draw a more distinct line between herself and her cousin. She appeals to Kate, exclaiming, and to quote, O oh, cousin Kate, my love was true, your love was writ in sand. This reveals that the speaker did feel herself in love with the Lord, though he used her. And she compares the true love she felt for this Lord with the love of her cousin Kate, who she claims that maybe doesn't have the same true and deep feelings for this man. However, ironically, this man has chosen her. The speaker then says, If he had fooled not me but you, if he stood where I stand, he'd not have won me with his love. 
In other words, she's saying that Kate was fortunate enough to be able to watch what happened to her cousin before the Lord took interest in herself. Therefore, Kate was clever in scheming and seducing him, but not necessarily losing her virginity to this Lord before marriage, hence why she won and became married. Now in the sixth stanza, the speaker continues to contrast herself with Kate. Up until now, she's shown that she's living a life of shame while Kate lives a life of glory. Kate has done the right things socially that I expected of women at that time. She's shown that Kate was stronger, but the speaker's own love was more true for the Lord. Here she then says to Kate, and to quote, of a gift you've not got and seem not like to get. She goes on to dismiss Kate's beautiful clothes and her wedding ring, and she tells her cousin that she knows she must fret about what she doesn't have. Then she reveals what the gift this is. The great Lord had given her a fair-haired son, which she calls her shame and pride in one breath. And of course, this is oxymoron. In other words, this affair that the speaker had also led to a child. And of course, at the time, contextually, this was seen as an illegitimate child. So lots of society saw this as really shameful. However, the speaker actually loves her son. So even if the son was birthed out of shame, actually the contrasting oxymoron shows that the speaker doesn't feel shame. Also, when it comes to this description, she mentions a coronet, which is a simple crown, often worn by lesser royalty. The speaker reminds Kate that, although she's been named a lady and has a rich and possibly well-known husband, she herself will come to nothing without a son who she can bear for this Lord to inherit the wealth of his parents. In other words, this speaker has one up to Kate. She has a son, even if it's an illegitimate son. Remember at the time, women couldn't inherit property. So Kate now has pressure to bear a son to this Lord. Otherwise, she will also be in a really precarious position, even if she's the wife. Of course, bear in mind that also during this time, women were married away with dowry but they were not given an inheritance as I've mentioned. So it's not really clear whether Kate was unable to have children or whether she seemed to only have female girls. Whatever it is, the speaker is implying that in some ways she's still one up to Kate, even if she is the mother of the illegitimate son. Now let's move on to the next poem in this collection, which is half cast by John Agard. Now, John Agard was born on the 21st of June, 1949, and he's a contemporary poet, and he was born in Guyana. He lives in Southeast England, but he's a first generation immigrant from Guyana. And so a lot of his poetry reflects his views as an immigrant within England. Now, the poem itself and the title is powerful. The word half caste is actually a derogatory term and it's used for a person of mixed race descent. Do bear in mind, of course, that this term we no longer use because it's derogatory. It's a really, really racist term. However, John Agard, who himself is of mixed race descent, is using this. Now, he's using this, of course, to prove a social point. Now, one thing to bear in mind is that the speaker is beginning this poem by excusing himself for being half caste. Bear in mind that this term was actually used during the British Empire and during the period which you can associate with slavery to refer to children who the laws at the time prevented white people, so white British and white colonialists from mixing with African people or people of African descent. And of course, half caste, the word came from the idea that the children who would be produced from such a union were almost half breeds. However, of course, this poem and its whole idea is to deride the racism inherent within this term. The majority of the poem is filled with the speaker responding to being called half caste by a lot of racist people and showing just how foolish it is to not only hold these racist views, but even the term itself doesn't make any sense. So, of course, bear in mind that the main point of this poem is to essentially deride these racist views of people of mixed race ethnicity and, of course, to also broadly question people who just generally hold racist views. Now, when it comes to the first stanza, it's important here to touch on a god's diction, in other words, his use of words, because a lot of the language in this poem is written phonetically as it's pronounced. Now, let's look at specifically the word caste, which is associated with the word purity. 
Therefore, it's easy to assume that half-caste is a derogatory term for someone or someone who is in some way impure. And if this is the case, then they're not of one single race. Now, do bear in mind that this term was once accepted. However, of course, today it's clearly insulting and it's considered racist and fueled with ignorance and prejudice. Now, of course, Agard does employ sarcasm in this first stanza, seemingly apologising for being of mixed race descent to people who are racist, people who are angry at his very existence. He appears to apologise for that. It's evident in the stanzas that follow at first that he's really not apologising. In fact, he's lauding and celebrating the fact that his, and to quote, half cast. After the first stanza, Agard writes the rest of his poem using Caribbean English dialect and as I've mentioned, the rest of the poem is written phonetically and he speaks and he writes it as he would speak it as a Caribbean. Agard also uses very little punctuation. There's a lot of enjambement throughout the poem, lending a sense of urgency to the speaker's response. He seems obviously very passionate about this topic and he feels the need to rush in order to fully defend himself as someone who, by society or a racist society, has been labelled as, and to quote, half caste. Now, when it comes to the second and third stanzas, they are filled with several metaphors. Agard compares being half caste to the black and white piano keys that make a symphony and Picasso himself, so the Picasso the painter, mixing reds and greens to create his masterpieces. He demands to know what the person asking him or calling him half-caste really means by pointing to these things and saying that it's actually really impossible to have any form of purity, not only in terms of race, but in any form of or sphere of life. Things are mixed and it's silly and very foolish to see think this as something terrible. In fact, it adds more colour and beauty to the world. Now, Agard's blatant disregard for punctuation and capitalization is interesting because he separates each example he gives without a question mark, but rather a slash, creating an interesting division between each scenario. Again, these add to the confrontational and really angry tone of the poem. Of course, the speaker is really angry at this racist person who presumably has addressed him as half caste and is asking them these questions. Agard also, of course, uses repetition throughout, constantly asking the person who he's speaking to, explain yourself what you mean when you say half caste. Also, Agard compares the English weather to being half caste, saying the mix of the sun and clouds in the sky is always present in England, which of course is also meant to be somewhat humorous. His anger shows this example using the word spiteful when discussing how the clouds seem not to want the sun to be visible. He then uses a phonetic Caribbean word, aras, which shows, which is also an expletive, in other words, it's a swear word, and it shows, of course, how angry he is. Now, this phrase is a Creole term that essentially translates to my ass, and it's something that someone says when they're really angry and dismissing somebody else's argument or viewpoint. Also, of course, he alludes to Tchaikovsky, who's a famous Russian composer, and he's asking, did he, if he uses a piano and mixes the black and the white keys, create half caste symphonies just because of this? And does this therefore mean that his work isn't a masterpiece? And of course, this is a rhetorical question, and we know that Tchaikovsky, people love a lot of his classical music because it is masterpieces. And again, the whole idea and the whole point is to show that actually there's so much richer life and colour when you mix different colours together and when there's more racial harmony. Now in the third stanza, the examples of half caste sees and the tone becomes increasingly angry and accusatory. The speaker then takes an inward glance at himself, telling the reader that he, because he's only half, he can only listen with half of his ear, offer half of a hand when someone needs help, and dream with only one eye half closed. And it's difficult to separate the stanza line by line, since there's so many ideas strung together. Now, in the final six lines of the poem, a god says he's only half of a human being who casts only half of a shadow, but the other person who he's addressing can come back tomorrow with his whole mind, all of his eyes, ears, and his mind open, and maybe understand his perspective of someone who is an ethnic minority. And perhaps in this way, the person who's calling him half caste can realize that it is they who are ignorant. Now the fourth stanza is a continuation of the third, and a god is telling the person who he's addressing to come back with a whole mind and perhaps learn more of his story. Now, the next poem is Exposure by Wilfred Owen. 
Now, contextually speaking, do bear in mind that Wilfred Owen was born in 1893, which is towards the end of the Victorian era, and bear in mind that he himself served as a soldier in the First World War. Indeed, he died during this First World War. Also bear in mind that a lot of his poetry, which was written surrounding the war, was actually fairly critical of the First World War. Now, when it comes to the poem itself, Exposure, the beauty of his poetry lies in the simplicity of its words. In the first stanza, we find that the speaker doesn't really tangle himself up in words that show what he means. We get the setting of a really bleak French landscape without delay, and the surroundings are then brought to life by using action verbs. For instance, the poem states, our brains ache in the merciless e iced east winds that knife us. The use of this language shows that the soldiers are truly alone in a really hostile environment. And of course, remember that this poem is contextually referring to the First World War. And if you want to be more specific, you can also refer to battles such as the Battle of Dunkirk during this war. However, it's really interesting that the enemy in this war is nature itself. Nature appears to have turned against them and is cutting at them and essentially also killing them. So the enemy within this poem, which is interesting, is nature, the winter, which is killing lots of soldiers. And do bear in mind again contextually that a lot of soldiers in the First World War actually died due to the terrible conditions that they lived in rather than from enemy fire. Now, in the second stanza, Owen introduces the war. It's always present, even when it's not visible. The phrase twitching agonies, although simple, helps to nudge the reader into the poem. It also shows the distant prevalence of war, although it's not immediately there, it's constantly felt like a dull rumour. Once more, we sense the confusion of the soldiers, who are asking the rhetorical question, what are we doing here? It's no secret that this war was not meant to last as long as it did. In other words, the First World War was meant to be a very short war. So of course, what this is doing is showing just how protracted it is and these soldiers are really losing faith in the war. Now, in the third stanza, this awful continuation of war seems to just be a cycle that's never ending. To quote from the poem, We only know war lasts, rain soaks, and clouds sag stormy. War is seen as an inevitable fact of life piece of nature that the soldiers have now taken to be as accurate as possible. Also, it seems that within this war, there's another greater war between the men and nature as Dawn is massing its melancholy army and it's attacking. So nature here is personified as another enemy and it's attacking and killing these soldiers. Now in the fourth stanza, nature again is continued to be depicted as an attacking force. The bullets are, and to quote, less deadly than the air that shudders black with snow. And this is powerful because it's actually showing that nature is even worse on the men than bullets themselves and bullets from enemies. Owen therefore gives the impression that the soldiers have been lost in a drifting, desolate land where everything is attacking them, including nature itself. So this is a really interesting perspective of nature as being the enemy. Now in the fifth stanza, note the misery inherent. The soldiers appear to be beaten, not only by the Germans, but by the weather and the awful crushing effect it has, has left them unable to fight and essentially they're in this shell hole of misery and in some ways waiting for death. They've reached the point of despair, which is so low, low that they believe that they're going to be swallowed up by nature. And so we're given this really sad and singular image of these soldiers, horrible situation. Of course, bear in mind that Owen is making a wider point, showing the horrific conditions that soldiers during the First World War had to endure. Now in the sixth stanza, even in peace, there's still exhaustion. To quote from the poem, the soldiers slowly drag our ghosts home. It's powerful because they're depicted as ghosts and even in times of peace, they are maybe half the men they used to be. Also, essentially, Owen states, and to quote from the poem, shutters and doors all closed, on us the doors are closed. And this shows the distance between the soldier and the civilian. The soldiers can't really envisage any more a state of peace. And what this could bring to mind is, of course, post-traumatic stress disorder for soldiers who've returned. They can't quite relate to civilians who don't understand entirely what life is like at war and how difficult life can be. Now, when it comes to the seventh and eighth stanzas, despair reaches a final low point. This is where the action should happen, and it must happen, however nothing does. The soldiers are dying alone on a field, they're frozen to death, and they're found by the members of the army that bury the dead. 
these members keep on coming across more bodies on the field and it seems that the soldiers have died this miserable and faraway death and they're in pain and intriguingly enough what's caused these deaths is nature and still and to quote but nothing happens and of course this serves an idea that these things cannot be changed now but also war is not really happening however people are dying needlessly now the next poem in this collection is The Charge of the Light Brigade by Alfred Lord Tennyson. So, according to T.S. Eliot, he saw Alfred Lord Tennyson as, and to quote from T.S. Eliot himself, the finest ear of any English poet since Milton. Now, Alfred Lord Tennyson wrote about the Crimea War in The Charge of the Light Brigade, and he in many ways crystallised the memory of this particular war. Bear in mind, he was a Victorian writer who was born in 1809 as Napoleonic rages, wars raged in Europe and he was born at a time of great change. And he was also a very successful poet, but also from the upper class elite. Now, in 1850, he published a series of poems, including this, and he was also someone who had a keen interest on the different wars that happened and especially the Crimean War. So now, of course, this poem itself, if we look at it, is a depiction of the men who died of battle during the war in Crimea. This is a war that took place in the 1800s between Britain and the Russians. Now, in the first stanza, the speaker reveals the subject of the poem, which are the 600 men who rode to their deaths. He claimed that they were marching straight into the Valley of Death. The mention of the Valley of Death is a biblical reference to a book of Psalms, verse 23. This, of course, could also offer hope because within this verse in the Bible, it states, Yeah, I walk through the valley in the shadow of death. I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Of course, this is suggesting that God is always with somebody in spite of the challenges they face. Now, the speaker uses this to suggest that the men who were marching to the death were still being followed by God. And, however, they are still referring to the place as the valley of death, which suggests that, of course, these men know that they will be dying. Therefore, they're taking comfort in the fact that they will meet God after their deaths. Now, in this second stanza, the speaker reveals the thoughts of the soldiers as they march on. There they know that someone had made a mistake which will cost them their lives. They press on anyway. Bear in mind that this poem is based on the Crimea War, but it's based on a specific episode within the Crimea War where acting on wrong orders, there's a charge of around 600 men who go to a far more larger and better prepared Russian army. And because of these mistaken orders, these soldiers die. However, what this second stanza is showing is that even if these men at one point as they're charging realize that they will probably die and they've acted on false information, they still do so quite very valiantly and they see it as a duty to follow the commands that they've been asked to do. Now, in the third stanza, there's an attestment to the boldness that these men rode and of course to quote from the poem they rode into the mouth of hell which is also hyperbole now we get the sense that there was perhaps a speaker who is there to see it all the men knew that they were trapped there were cannons on all sides of them however they still rode into the battle and the speaker says that they rode well we as readers can therefore imagine these brave men who are going to their certain deaths. However, this also is supposed to show the pride that they have in the country, which is Britain, and the pride that they have to die for their country in battle. Now, when it comes to the fourth stanza, there's a revelation that while this army of 600 charged their deaths, the rest of the world wondered why they were ordered into that death trap. In other words, of course, this is meant to criticise the people that gave the marching orders the powers that be. The only people not wandering, interestingly, are the soldiers themselves who are simply following orders and doing their duty even if they are going to die. And at the end of the stanza, the speaker reveals that some did come out alive. These were the ones who, and to quote, rode back. However, there's a clarification that it's not the 600 who returned, showing that, of course, very few made it out alive. And historically speaking, 200 of the 40, out of the men, 247 of them returned home from battle out of 600 men. Now in the fifth stanza, 
The speaker states that there were cannons on all sides of the men and both horse and hero fell, attesting to their bravery and showing that they fought so well. And of course the speaker finds it miraculous that there were still men who survived this horrendous battle. In the sixth stanza, the speaker calls to honour the 600 men who marched with the Light Brigade in the Battle of Baklava, and he asks a rhetorical question, when can their glory fade, suggesting that they will be forever remembered for their honour in marching so bravely into the Valley of Death, so even if the British fighters did not win this particular war, they are still immortalised because the speaker says that they did their duty as all soldiers should. Now the next poem in this collection is Katrin by Gillian Clark. So Gillian Clark is a contemporary poet and she was born in Cardiff and she lives in Ceredigion. Her work has been on the GCSE syllabus which you're currently studying and her books have also been published by Faber. Now when it comes to the poem itself, Catherine displays the love and turmoil in the parent-child relationship. The particular poem centres around a conflict that seems to have escalated into fury rather quickly. Through Clark's use of imagery, the speaker is able to convey feelings of love and affection along with frustration of dealing with the conflict that inevitably arises between a parent and child. At the start of the poem, the speaker reveals that the person to whom she speaks to is a child, but she doesn't reveal her position immediately. Because the author is female, it's easy to assume that the speaker is a mother, and for simplicity's sake, this analysis will assume just as much. However, the gender of the child in the poem isn't really stated, but however it's implied and based on the voice of the speaker and the short description of the child, it's most probably a mother and daughter, and the conflict itself remains unresolved by the end of the poem, but both mother and daughter are apparently changed. Now, in the first stanza, the opening creates a setting and imagery for the rest of it. The reader can picture a child looking longingly out of a window, watching the traffic lights come and change as cars drive. The speaker describes the room as hot and white, which allows the reader to feel the intensity that the speaker feels as she stands there watching the child look out of the window. The speaker then describes that this first incident was the, and to quote, first fierce confrontation. And the use of the word fierce reveals the impact that this conflict had on the speaker as well as the child. The speaker uses the game of the tug of war to provide an analogy for the conflict between herself and the child. The rope is described as red to represent the love that there exists between the two of them, and though they both pulled on each end of the rope as tightly as they could, they were still inevitably connected by this rope of love which couldn't be severed, which symbolises the love and devotion that remains between mother and child. The speaker then moves into a different description of the relationship between the two. She describes the room as a blank canvas, which was empty and white before the child was born, but now it's full of memories, ranging from coloured walls to paintings, toys and other things. The speaker then uses the word disinfected to reveal the reality of this confrontation. She remembers all the things she's disinfected over the years in order to keep the child healthy and describes the way she coloured over all the walls with the words and this parallels the way in which a child can colour the walls when they're young. Now the mother has coloured the walls of the child, just as the child colouring on the wall could frustrate her parents, the mother's words seem to be really frustrating to the child. Through describing the pictures, she draws with her words. She describes the struggle between herself and the child, explaining that they were each fighting, and to quote, to become separate. She also says, and to quote from the poem, we want, we shouted, to be two, to be ourselves. Now this quote reveals that the speaker understands that her child is a separate being with different feelings and ideas and an identity. However, it's still clear that whatever the mother and child are fighting over, it's worth the fight to the mother. And even if she's able to recognise the child's desire to be her own person, she still continues to hold on to her end of the rope, fighting this fight that has led to such frustration and anger between them. Now in the second stanza, the speaker reveals that she doesn't feel as though either of them have won. However, they were both changed from it. Now, it seems the dynamic of the mother-child relationship has shifted when the two encountered this conflict and the speaker feels that they've stuck in a fish tank which was so clouded with feelings that neither one could see clearly and it's unclear whether this anthology of the fish tank suggests the presence of another person or whether the speaker just simply feels emotionally exposed. The speaker feels as if they've both been changed, yet she says in the poem, I'm still fighting you off. For the first time in this poem, it seems that this conflict is specifically between mother and daughter. There's also the description of the long brown hair and the rosy defiant glare, which suggests feminine features. Now, the defiant glare is what the speaker describes as 
springing up from the hard spool, that old rope tightening about my life. This is a perfect way to describe the ties between her mother and daughter, and there's a rope that comes directly from the mother's heart, and her daughter's glare seems to pull at this rope, and the speaker feels it tighten around her life. Now, when it comes to mother-daughter relationship, they're always both. The speaker has eloquently described the way this conflict has pulled at the rope of her heart and how she's unable to let go of it no matter how much it hurts. And now at the end of the poem, the speaker reveals the reason for this conflict. The daughter has asked to skate, and to quote, in the dark for one more hour. The last few lines of this poem reveal the intensity of parenting. Although it seems like a little conflict, there's clearly been quite an incredible amount of pain and frustration that's occurred over whether or not the daughter could skate for another hour. This also reveals the reason the mother couldn't let go of this rope. At the beginning of the poem, the mother describes the traffic outside, and although the daughter was unable to acknowledge the danger of skating in the dark, the mother could see through this danger clearly. She loved her daughter far too much to let go of the rope and to let her have this extra time, and she faces the pain of the daughter's defiant glare. She stands her ground because, as her mother, it's her job to protect her from the imminent danger of skating in the dark near heavy traffic. And it's interesting that this stanza begins with the speaker claiming that neither of them won. However, it appears that the doctor wasn't allowed to skate in the dark, so clearly it's the speaker who's won the argument. However, the mother feels that this is really rather a hollow victory. Instead, she feels that both have been changed and she's really lost something in the process. And it's for this reason that they both seem lost. By the end of the poem, the reader can see the importance of the mother-daughter relationship as well as the uniqueness, as well as the necessity for conflict. The mother wouldn't relent because she wouldn't allow her daughter to place herself in harm's way. Her love for her daughter is too great for her to relent. And the daughter herself wouldn't relent because she's unable to see the danger she could be in and she just badly wanted to skate for another hour. This poem allows us as readers to understand the really intense dynamics in parent-child relationships and the different and difficult roles that both of them have to play. Now, early in the poem, the speaker revealed her acknowledgement that her daughter was being a separate person, or in other words, trying to assert her separate identity. She clearly had her own will and desires, and those desires didn't always comply with her mother's. And now, as a mother, she understands this fully and chooses, in this instance, not to let go of the argument. However, she also realises that ultimately she will have to let her daughter develop her own separate identity. Now, let's move on to the next poem in this collection, which is War Photographer by Carol Satyamutri. Now, the poet herself, Carol Satyamutri, is a poet and sociologist, and she's a contemporary poet. And she grew up in Kent and has lived in North America, Singapore, and Uganda. And her poetry, as well as her work, has been awarded an, a number of prizes. She herself is also an experienced performer and an active participant in the contemporary poetry world through being competition and judge and workshop tutor. Now, in the poem itself, War Photographer. This poem centres around the tragic, comparing poverty to leisure. Now, the author herself, or the poet herself, is known for facing pain and suffering head-on in her works of poetry. And now, the words of this poem centre around modern warfare and explicitly reveal the minor detail the effects of war have on people's lives. Now, in the first stanza, the speaker uses intense imagery to reveal what a picture of war can do to the viewer. Upon first glance, the picture is safely inside a frame, and to most viewers, the photo is of a different place and perhaps even a different time. Thus, one isn't entirely forced to enter the photo. The speaker also reveals that, as a person looks at a photograph, they can think outside the frame of the photo and believe that, and to quote, people eat, sleep, love normally. But life is different for the photographer herself. She must, and to quote, seek out the tragic and thus live in it. For the one who sees the reality of war firsthand as a war photographer, life outside of war is hard to imagine. One might even forget that it exists and the speaker mentions the edges of the photo again, implying that the, and to quote, firmness of the edges can help a person live outside the tragedy of war, keeping the reality safely within the borders of the picture. However, there are other pictures that lift the heart and most people tend to look at these pictures and convince themselves that this is how things are. The photographer herself, however, knows that these photos are only a snapshot in time and never fully encompass the way things are at any time and place. 
Now in the second stanza, the speaker recalls a picture she took in Ascot, which is a very well-to-do, uh, a place where people go to watch horses, and these tend to be very well-to-do people. Now the picture was clearly of rich and fairly privileged girls in England, and she describes them as wearing silk and giggling in the grass as they sip champagne. This is clearly a group of girls who she sees representing happiness and perhaps some ignorance of tragedies going on in the world around them. And the purpose of this stanza is to reinforce what the speaker said in the previous stanza, concerning viewers' ability to believe in the truthfulness of the happy photos rather than the tragic ones. Now the imagery provided here, of course, are a contrast to the image the speaker presents in the rest of the poem, allowing readers to understand the irony of the fact that some people get to enjoy wealth whilst others suffer tragedy. Now in the third stanza, the speaker drives her point her home, or rather her point home, providing a specific instance and revealing that it happened instantly. She remembers and to quote, following a small girl as she was staggering down some devastated streets. Now we're taking back to a place of war. The vivid description of the small child allows the reader to enter into this warlike scene and feel as though they're there with a the photographer following the small girl. She describes the way her hip thrust out under a baby's weight and reveals that the small girl was not only so weak but she was staggering and she walked down a street that could only be described as devastated and on top of that she had to look after a baby even if she was only her child herself. The photographer looks at this girl and takes a picture just as the girl turns to look at her and this subtle description of this act of taking the picture allows the readers to enter into this photographer's reality. She really can't do much to help the child, she's simply there just to report and take pictures of this very different life. The readers then understand that there's so much more to realities happening behind pictures that they see. They, also, they only see a photo of an impoverished child caring for the baby, but they don't know how it feels to see that child firsthand and know that the child has seen you in their suffering. They furthermore don't know how it's like to be in the shoes of that child. Now in the fourth stanza, the speaker continues to describe the small child who held the baby. The fact that the bomb is described as, and to quote, the first bomb of the morning is interesting as it suggests that there have been numerous bombs prior to this one and many more bombs will follow. This poem becomes all the more shocking, however, when the child drops the baby she's carrying and flees for her own life with a scream, which seemed too loud for them from the mouth from which it came. This of course shows how her innocence is destroyed and it reflects the contrast between this stanza and the second stanza, suggesting that when it comes down to it, human nature by instinct will cause one to take care of themselves first and foremost and it offers more insight into the reason that some enjoy lavish riches whilst others starve. Now in the fifth stanza, the photographer reveals the way pictures can be deceiving. When she first saw the child firsthand and looked into her eyes, heard her scream and watched her run, dropping the baby, the picture she took didn't capture this entire story. In the picture, it looked almost as if the child was maybe smiling. And the caption reveals to the, that the photographer played a role in this deception to the public. Whether she wrote the caption herself or simply allowed her to be published, she as a photographer knows the realities of life for this young child were not truthfully reflected in the photo. The caption said that, to quote, even in hell, the human spirit triumphs over all. This gives the readers a false idea that the child is happy and is maybe somehow going to overcome this, when really this is not going to be the case. And this allows readers to believe that even though the war is going on and people are starving, people might still even be happy with this. And the photographer knows this is patently untrue. However, this is apparently what the public want to hear. Therefore, this is what the, is published along with the photograph. The last three lines, however, reveal that the photographer is aware of the deception of her photos and wants to proclaim the truth. She explains that, and to quote, hell doesn't have specific boundaries at the edges of the photo. Rather, these boundaries are arbitrary as a blood stain on a wall. This ending reveals that pain and suffering themselves are arbitrary and senseless, and it's not fair that some people get to bathe and drink champagne and go to watch horse races in Ascot, whilst others scream and run in terror as bombs go off around them, which reveals, of course, the injustice that goes on in a world which is so small, hence so unfair. But also this shows just how deeply divided one part of the world is, which experiences injustice, whether the other side of the world, which experiences lots of wealth. So let's look at Belfast Confetti by Kieran Carson. Now, Carson is a contemporary poet who was born in 1948. 
who's not only a poet, but an amazing novelist who is cherished by almost all those who love literature. Born and brought up in Belfast, Northern Ireland, he writes both poetry and prose, which is often heavily influenced by his Irish roots. Now, this poem uses past tense to describe the violence against the Catholic crowd in the place. Carlson uses the same tense to portray different effects of being in the middle of conflict. The poet also uses present tense to portray a live scene of what he went through during a time he witnessed violence. And of course, do you remember contextually that Carson himself grew up in Northern Ireland, which was the site of several conflicts with regards to the IRA. And so, of course, this is highly influencing this poem. Now, the speaker uses this present tense to describe this experience in the aftermath of the riot. The poet has therefore used first person narrative style to describe his feelings in the most efficient way. And this is a free verse poem. Now, this poem is like watching a live scene after a riot between the shipyard workers who were the Protestants and the Catholics. Exclamation marks depict the screaming voices of people who are being ruthlessly killed during this riots. We can hear, and to quote from the poem, nuts, bolts, nails, car keys, which script the scrap metals used as weapons by the Protestants. Asterisk describe, depicts the sparkles that were born due to the explosion during the fight. And we get lots of language, such as the word stuttering, to depict how petrified the person is who's watching all of these things happen and how they haunt his memories forever. Now, the poet states that it's impossible for him to find an escape during this riot because every road has a, and to quote, dead end again. The use of the dead end depicts dead bodies lying at different places, roadblocks, and these dead bodies have blocked his way due to which he can't wait, find a way to escape. The poet then asks, why can't I escape, which depicts the helplessness, and even though he wishes to leave, and he knows that he's survived, he's unable to get rid of this helplessness feeling and being unable to help those who've lost their lives in this riot that he's witnessed. Furthermore, this poem shows this person who's witnessing the death of several people right before his eyes, due to which he just can't forget these violent memories, and we can argue that he is sh experiencing post-traumatic stress disorder. Also, the quote, a fusillade of question marks, depicts the questions raised by the innocent eyes of the Catholics who were slaughtered by merciless nationalist groups during this riot. Now let's move on to the next poem, which is The Class Game by Mark Casey. Now, Mark Casey, Mary Casey rather, was born in Hampshire in 1915 and died in Dorset at midnight in 1980. She published two collections from her poems and she has also published different books which contain the correspondence between Mary and her husband Gerald Casey in this book specifically is called Night Horizons. Now, when it comes to the poem itself, this fascinating poem shows the speaker challenging her audience to ponder the game they're playing. This game she refers to as a class game, and the class game is a game in which people look at a person and try to guess what social class they're from based on their parents. They try to guess where they may live, how they talk and so on, and the speaker refers to it as a game with heavy sarcasm in her voice because she knows it's not really a game at all, rather it's a harsh judgement that on a daily basis people use to critique others and this ironic reference as a way of thinking as a game allows readers to see how truly harmful this ignorance and also this prejudice really is. Now, when we look at lines one to five, the speaker begins with a challenging tone of voice and readers can immediately sense her intent to call out certain people and challenge the way of thinking. She asks them to quote from the poem. How can you tell what class I'm from? And then she describes some specifics about her attire and she believes others are using this to guess her social class. She explains that she can, and to quote, talk posh, which reveals her social status to others. She also explains that she wears a hat rather than a scarf and her clothes are secondhand. Now, in line 6 to 11, the speaker continues to challenge her audience, asking them why they wince when they hear her say certain things. For example, she says, Tara to me ma, rather than the more proper way of saying, by mommy dear. The speaker clearly conveys why it matters, how she says goodbye to her mother, and why it should make some people cringe to hear it. So she calls them out, asking them why they wince when she speaks. She asks again, and to quote, how can you tell what class I'm from? And then continues to guess that perhaps they saw where she lives. In her home, she describes a carpy 
And this word, corpy, is an old term used by those who lived in Liverpool, which is in the northern part of England, to describe what's known as a council house, which is an inexpensive home that could be afforded by the working class and usually partly funded by the government. The speaker challenges her audience to really think about what they know about the class she comes from. She's not denying that she talks in a certain way, dresses in second-hand clothes and lives in a cheap government-funded home. Her tone does not deny any of these things, however, it does challenge the hearers to think about why they cringe when they see evidence of this social class. Now in lines 12 to 15, the speaker points out things about her that make her close social class stand out. She asks the hearers if you know her social class because she happened to drop an unemployment card. Her distinctly asking whether she dropped in on the patio reveals that she doesn't have a patio herself, just a yard. Again, she asks the people that are listening how they can tell which class she's from, and she feels that her social class is so obvious to pass her by that she may as well have a label on her head and another on her bum. Her tone here begins to reveal the question she's really trying to ask her listeners. She knows her speech and dress reveal her social class, but she questions why these small differences in appearance make others see her so vastly differently. In line 16 to 19, the speaker reiterates a few points she's already made. She questions an onlooker, asking if he or she knows her social class because of the oil stains on her hand. She points out that her hands are not, and to quote, soft, lily white with perfume and oil, like the rich women surrounding her. She questions an audience on whether the yet gets a social class based on this or if it's the way she drinks her tea and if it's because she said toilet instead of the bog either way it's clear the speaker knows her social class is obvious and is only questioning to people to ask why they cringe and judge her as a result of a place in society in lines 20 to 26 the speaker finally comes right out and says what she's been implying alone her social class shouldn't really concern others it's none of their business and then she asks blatantly why do you care what class I'm from? Then, in a critical tone of voice, she asks, and to quote, Does it stick in your gullet like a sour plum? With this question, the reader can imagine the people to whom she's addressing, and they look as though they've just eaten something sour, and the glares make it clear that they have a lot of disdain for the speaker, though it shouldn't really matter to them what social class she's from. Then the speaker says, Well, mate indicating she's about to tell her spectators something important. She declares that her mother is a cleaner, her brother is a dock worker, and she declares that she will use slang such as and words such as wet nelly and belly. And she adamantly declares, and to quote, I'm proud of the class that I come from. The imagery throughout this poem serves to contrast two different lifestyles that existed in Liverpool. There was a working class and the wealthy classes within this city, and the speaker effectively contrasts both, pointing out that the only difference between these two kinds of people are details of small, certain words used, clothing worn, and places dwelled in, as well as appearance of their hands. These are all outward de details and have nothing to do with the inward soul of the person, and for this reason, the speaker questions her critics, and these questions become all the more powerful as the poem progresses. All her questions are rhetorical and they cause the reader to stop and ponder what really makes one person different from another. This question addresses those who are in the wealthy classes, those who cringe when she speaks in slang and cast a critical eye on her second-hand clothing. The type of people she addresses clearly view themselves as different and in many ways superior from her in terms of her working class background. However, her questions also reveal that the only differences between the two classes are outward appearance and material possession. Thus, the class game is irrelevant. It's a game that shouldn't really be played and a question make these onlookers who wince at her appear shallow and thoughtless themselves. And the goal throughout the poem is to point out the foolishness of this class game. In the end, however, she doesn't seem to care for what other people think and she's proud to be part of the working class. She's proud her mother has worked hard and taught her the value of hard work, as well as her brother, and she's proud of everything about where she's from. And her final question to critics, which is, why do you care what class I'm from, shows that in many ways they are the ones who are shallow and thoughtless and she wants this question to resound in the minds of readers. Now the next poem in this collection is Poppies by Jane Weir. So Jane Ware was born in 1963 and she spent her time growing up in Italy and England and she's a mother of two sons, neither of whom have actually been to war, so it's a fair assumption that she's not the mother described in the poppies in this poem. Written during a time when British soldiers, however, were fighting in Iraq and Afghanistan, so these are two modern wars, 
Caroline Duffy, the Poet Laureate, also asked a number of writers to create works to frame this ongoing war, and of course among these is Poppies by Jane Ware, which addresses this and in many ways is a commemoration, and we can argue that she drew her inspiration from being a mother, and above all the sense of grief that's held in the poem for someone who's lost the child at war. Now, her poetry displays an array of social, historical and political preoccupations, having themes which diversely range in terms of scenarios, situations and voices. And the principal motive is language itself, its mutability in representing both the abstract as well as the real. Now, the form of this poem and the synthetic aspect of this poem are mixed with the traditional and it seems that there's both some sense of withering humour as well as a striking sense of pathos. However, there's still a profound ambivalence within this poem. Now, in the first stanza, we can argue that this poem is without adherence to any kind of syllable, count or rhyme. It's written quite freely and the narrator is introduced as someone who said goodbye to someone who's presumably left the war, presumably also their child. Poppies takes place three days before Armistice Sunday, to quote from the poem. This, in England at least, is more commonly known as Remembrance Day, and this was an armistice as a formal agreement for a ceasefire. This is symbolic of something the narrator is daily wishing for, an end to hostilities that threaten those who fight in the war, including the person whose lapel they pinned a poppy to, and again we can presume that this is their child who they pinned the, a, a poppy to before he left for war. Now, in the second and third stanzas, the narrator is simply speaking to the memory of who we learn is her son, or probably her son, and the narrator reveals her desire to take them in her arms and run her hands through his hair and rub noses together like she did when he was a younger boy. Ultimately, she resists these impulses and walks beside him to the front door as he leaves, and where well, there's no moment for goodbye, but rather the simple opening of the door, and then he's gone. Now, the quote and the word intoxication suggests that he's really eager to go to war, whilst his mother, of course, is watching and she's feeling really sad. Interestingly, we can see that this is something he as a soldier looks forward to, without really thinking about it or understanding the atrocity and the gravity of the situation he's walking into when he does go to war. Now, after an undisclosed amount of time goes by, the narrator notices that there's a dove flying through town and with no explanation, she follows it, even though it's really cold outside. And this is because Remembrance Day, when we think about the timing, is in early November, and this is a time in England, at least, when it's really cold. She then finds herself outside the walls of a local church, and there's a moment of character development here for the narrator. She follows the bird on a whim, perhaps, because doves often symbolise peace, but also because there's nothing else to do once her son is gone. Now, in the fourth stanza, the narrator follows the bird to the top of the hill where there's a war memorial. The description of the dove flying away suggests its purpose is to lead the mother to that memorial, and it suggests that the mother is reliving the memory of her son leaving, because it's the last memory she may ever have of him. Perhaps we learn that he died in the war, and the inscription being traced as the name of her son. She tries to recall him as a young child, freely playing in the playgrounds with the innocence and peace of that time. However, this memory is rewarded only with silence. It's not expressly stated her son is dead, but the theme of the poem and the noticeable extension of the sudden atmosphere make it a suggestion that perhaps her son did die and this poem is about grief and loss. Now, the next poem in this collection is No Problem by Benjamin Zephaniah. Now, Benjamin Zephaniah was born and raised in Birmingham, England, and he finished full-time education at the age of 13. His poetry is strongly influenced by music and poetry of Jamaica, which is where he originally comes from, and what he calls street politics. Now, a lot of his work also is influenced in the early 80s, where there were a lot of demonstrations and a lot of youth gatherings outside of police stations, but also a lot of radical protests, and a lot of his work focuses in on that. Now, when you look at the poem itself, no problem. It's divided into two verses of short lines without any particular adherence to a rhyme pattern. The primary poetic device being used in the line breaks that isolate each other is these breaks, and they make sure that the reader is feeling the full impact of each line. 
Now, the most striking thing about Zephaniah's work is his use of voice, which he imbues throughout the poem, though intentionally sparing the words phonetically rather than in a strict, correct way, much like John A. God in Half Cast. Now, the spelling of each word emphasises an accent typical, in this case, of the African continent, which makes sense in accordance with the message that the work attempts to convey. Importantly, none of the changes in spelling um, inhibit the piece from conveying the meaning properly, but they add a new dimension to the poem. The first word in the poem is I, and it's followed by words that convey an accent foreign to the readership. Right away, the reader is informed that this is somebody else's story, we're told. And in the one line, this person is, maybe we learn that they might be an immigrant, and we wonder why we should care about what they have to say. However, this is all in the voice. Now, throughout the first verse, the line is repeated several times, I am not the problem, and each time to view a different dimension of the actual problem. The speaker declares the first time, but I am treated as though I were to quit from the poem. Now, the mention of taunts and slurs in the first few lines is a smart choice by the poet because an early reading of this and the context of the speaker shows that perhaps this person is an immigrant who is being victimised or being seen as a problem. Now, there's no reason to assume or believe they deserve any kind of victimisation, so the effect of stating I am not the problem but I am treated as if I were, is that the reader feels that the speaker, who presumably is an immigrant, is facing a gross injustice and this really imbues the poem with a sense and an edge which is quite emotional. Now, the next few lines in the opening poem reference a stereotype that pushes people of colour away from academia and towards athleticism. So one thing that Zephaniah is trying to reference is this stereotype that a lot of people of colour, particularly black people, are seen as only successful as entertainers of some sort, but they're not necessarily always associated with the academic world. Now, in this stanza, the speaker is described as being born an academic and branded by society an athlete, and of course referring back to this societal stereotype. The rest of the verse concludes similarly, with the narrator being constantly misunderstood. They're a person who could tell you about Timbuktu, but all anyone seems to care about is the dancing from the region. They're trying to convey here that they're a really complex individual, a unique and inspiring person, but the simplicity of popular stereotypes that surround them overshadows this entirely. Now, the last verse opens with an interesting expression, just for the record, that these conditions might affect the speaker as it ages. It's as though the opinions and scorn from others is actually debilitating for the speaker, and it com they compare it with age-related diseases, and despite this, they declare that they've got no grudges or anger towards anyone, and they point out that they actually have a number of really good friends in the same world that these stereotypes abuse them in. Now, the second verse is about putting a complete picture that the commentators are quoted in the first verse get wrong. The second verse is also about giving these commentators who have all of these stereotypes about the immigrant some clarity about them. The narrator speaks of not being the problem, and the repetition implies anger to some. Understandably enough, many people become bitter and unhappy about being blamed for so much for so long and also being put in a box. However, the image painted by this poem is someone with a great deal of acceptance for their world, both the good and bad within it. It's an interesting choice on the poet's part to use a voice that conveys the accent most associated with stereotypes being fought in the poem. By doing this, the poet is creating a conflicting view by perpetuating one element of the stereotype, which is an accent, but also dispelling the rest of the stereotypes. And this is a, a stylistic choice related to the pride reference in the second verse. And to quote, Mother country, get it right. The speaker seems proud of their accent and their country, and they don't want to be judged for that pride. Now let's move on to What Were They Like by Denise Levitov. Now, Denise Levitov is a well-recognised poet and writer who combines her own personal experience with historical facts. Through her poetic skills, she's able to build up a new poetic vision, and her work really influenced Charles Olson's essay, which was published in 1950, and in which the entire focus of his work remains on the possibilities of her work. 
However, just as she mediates or translates her personal experience into words, it also shows her great poetic skills and it's only by virtue of her poetry that readers can familiarise themselves with the poet and the speaker's experience and obtain a different level of understanding. Now, when it comes to the poem itself, what were they like? This is about the after effects of war and what happens when one culture conflicts with another culture. The poem specifically protests the damage done by the American military to the people of Vietnam during the Vietnam War between the two countries in the 60s and 70s. This poem has a really unique structure. It's split into two verses and the reasons for structuring the poem like this are given in the annotations that follow. Do the people of Vietnam use lanterns of stone? Do they hold ceremonies to reverence the opening of buds? Now, in this poem, Levitov is employing this very much public event to the Vietnam War as a canvas in which he sketches a lyrical song and creating sarcastic images which are very thought-provoking. Now, when we look at the first stanza, the poem opens with a series of questions about the past. The questions appear to suggest an ancient religious civilization grounded in old skills and appreciation of nature. The questions continue like a catechism and answers seem to be required. The material seems almost primitive and traditional. And when the poet says, had they an epic, they seem to be referring to the ancient mythical civilization, possibly Greeks and the two great odysseys such as Odyssey and Iliad. Now, in this first part of the poem, there's a lot of sarcastic questions, and this is perhaps meant as an attack on those who don't understand the value of lives of human beings. And through these questions, the poet really wants to make readers think about and then look for answers. Through words like electricity and stones, the speaker wants to tell us that people of Vietnam passed perhaps a very simple and ordinary life. However, due to the attack of the American army on their country, the country was separated from more advanced nations such as America and the UK. And the poet wants to really create sympathy within us as readers for the Vietnamese who face this horrendous situation and realize that their simplistic way of life was really destroyed during this war. Also, through the imagery of lanterns of stone, the poet combines two interestingly incompatible things. This combination of words provokes readers to consider a diverse number of associations which set the mind in motion and lead them to different understandings of events. Now, where in the first stanza the speaker, the questioner, asks lots of questions, in the second stanza there's someone who gives answers to the questions. As we go through the verses it becomes clear the first speaker is a man perhaps and the second might know what happened. The very first word in the second stanza, which is sir, is used in a sarcastic tone. This catechism provides numbered answers which relate to the questions in the poem. Moreover, beginning with the formal term sir, hints that the person answering the question is being quite respectful, like a soldier answering the commander. However, this might be false respect. The speaker tells all those gleeful, joyful, uh, nature-loving people are now dead. So these people who were in Vietnam prior to the war, who really led very simplistic lives, have been killed by the war and their light hearts have been turned to stone, which means that the speaker has given lots of answers to the first verse of the stanza which asked, do the people of Vietnam use lanterns of stones? The speaker also shows that before the war, these people used to be happier and now there's nobody left to answer. Almost all of them have been turned to stone. In other words, they've been killed. Now, in the third stanza, answering questions of the speaker, the respondent of the poem says that there was a time when peaceful clouds used to reflect in the paddy fields and the water buffalo used to step along terraces. This person gives a very long answer to the question by describing what and how the culture of Vietnam was before the war. They say that the Vietnamese used to live a really simple life that was stable and calm and the paddy fields were waterlogged, however they remained rich with the gross of rice. However, the war has now destroyed all of this and there's only screams and horror and tears being shed all around. The bombs have smashed the mirrors and as these bombs were falling and this destruction was happening, many Vietnamese people didn't have time even to sing. What they could do was just scream and run to save their lives. 
Though not everything has vanished, there seems to be an echo of this speech. When the speaker asks, did they distinguish between speech and singing, the respondent answers, there is an echo yet of this speech, which was like a song. It's also reported that the Vietnamese singing resembles flights of moths in moonlight. In the last three verses, the poem again shows an image of a gentle and peaceful nation and readers are provided with really contrasting images of ruin after war. The poet employs a simile likening the flight of moths in moonlight to the voices of people singing and the speaker says that today Vietnam is silent because there's no one to sing, everybody is dead and all their legacies and songs are now gone along with the dead people. And the last sentence of the poem shifts into the present tense. It's a simple statement, but this contributes to the power of point. Many people are dead, a culture has been destroyed, and the strong image that suggests the beauty and delicateness of the Vietnamese culture and the sound of their music has now been destroyed. So that's all. If you found this summary useful, do consider giving a thumbs up to this video and subscribing to our channel for educational content. In addition, make sure you visit our website, which is www.firstratetutors.com. There you will find useful revision materials, worksheets and information that you can find helpful when studying both this anthology and indeed other books and literature when it comes to passing your coursework or exams. We hope you enjoyed it and thank you so much for listening.